Hello, legacy is rarely far from the headlines and this week it's been front and centre of the debate once again. The government's pushing ahead with its controversial legacy bill in the House of Lords, despite continuing opposition seemingly from all quarters. The NIO Minister Lord Kane is responsible for steering the bill through the Lords and he maintains his recent amendments have significantly improved it. Plenty of people disagree, among them Baroness O'Lone, from whom we'll hear shortly. But when Lord Kane came into the studio earlier, I began by raising the case of the hooded men. We now know the PSNI apologised to the men for the way they were treated under interrogation in 1971. So I asked Lord Kane if the police can apologise for what happened 52 years ago, why can't the government? Well, clearly, Mark, the uh, apology by the PSNI is entirely a matter for the PSNI. Uh, the government will obviously look at the uh, case. I think um, at the moment there are some ongoing legal proceedings uh, which uh, uh, make it very difficult to comment directly on the, on the case. Um, but you'll be aware that uh, in the past, when uh, the state has been found to be wanting in certain cases. I mean, uh, uh, Claudy, Bloody Sunday, uh, and, and others. You know, we we have apologised uh, where the uh, where the case has merited that. But as I say, um, in the specific uh, instance of the hooded men, there are some ongoing legal processes which makes it difficult for me to go any further. It is an example of the government seeming to be on the wrong page, though, isn't it? These men and the families of those who have since died want an apology for what they were subjected to. Um, the police has been able to find a way to make that happen. Yeah. Um, you're saying you can't at this stage, but do you endorse what the PSNI has done? Do uh, you see that as a positive development? Uh, of, of course, I you know, support the police and the, and the PSNI. Um, uh, and we would have to look at the at the case uh, uh, from a government perspective. Uh, as I say, there are some ongoing legal proceedings which uh, uh, make it difficult for me to comment directly on this. But we've been very upfront in the past when uh, uh, when things have gone wrong on the government's watch, on the state's watch, if you like, uh, and, and have been prepared to stand up and apologise. I was involved in drafting David Cameron's statement in June 2010 on Bloody Sunday, which, as you know, had a pretty dramatic impact uh, on the day. I was also involved in the apology over the failings in the Claudy case. So this is not something that we are close to uh, by, by any means. Um, yeah, we want to do the right thing, but there are processes ongoing. Um, the solicitor, Dara Macken, who's involved in the case on behalf of the family, says, and I'll just quote him, this case is an example of why the efforts by the British government to brush the legacy of the past under the carpet will never and can never work. Um, it is obviously, in his view, another example of the government not listening to the concerns of victims half a century on. Yeah. And it is not the government's intention or desire to brush the legacy of the past under the carpet. Uh, on the contrary, the proposals that we brought forward uh, would, in our view, put far more information into the public domain than has ever been the case before uh, through the new uh, independent commission that we uh, uh, plan to set up uh, should the bill currently before Parliament uh, receive royal assent. So our, our intention all along, uh, as I said in an interview last week, has not been to engage in some almighty cover-up. It's, it's it's quite the opposite. It's to get more information out there into the public domain and answer more questions. Um, um, I'll come on to the... And, and, and I should add, Mark, in those circumstances, you know, I would quite expect that there will be things emerge in the, those processes that will be embarrassing for the British state uh, as well as embarrassing for others. OK, well, we'll come on to the ICRIR in just a moment or do in a bit more detail. But I think that the family of another case that's been in the... Uh, uh, spotlight this week might be very interested to, to hear you elaborate on some of what you've just been talking about. I mean, what do you say to the family of Sean Brown, who was murdered by loyalists in Balaki in 1997, who've asked for your legacy bill to be paused because they fear delays to the inquest which emerged this week will push it past the new deadline set by your plans of May the 1st, 2024, and essentially run the inquest into Mr Brown's murder into the sand? Yes. Well, one thing uh, to be clear about is that we're not uh, uh, trying to um, uh, 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 pause, uh, 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 we're not pausing the bill. Uh, it's coming before the House of Lords uh, next week for its report stage uh, 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 on the 21st and then the 26th 
of this month. Um, but I've taken a very long time over the bill. Uh, I first introduced it in July last year into the Lords, and uh, we didn't do second reading till November. And I did make a pledge at second reading last year that I would try and do my best uh, to improve the bill uh, and put it into a better shape uh, than uh, the House of Commons had sent uh, to us uh, when we returned it to the House of Commons in, in, in due course. Um, you know, we're not in, we, we, we don't want to delay, but the, what the case you've referred to does highlight one of the problems of the current inquest system, yeah. which is they are prone to delays because of you know, lengthy, lengthy processes but, but that's over, the point, over, isn't it? over yeah, reducting that, that, material. That is we, the point, we, because the coroner yeah. in the Brown inquest this week criticised delays created by the PSNI in proceedings and, in fact, accused the police of trying to dictate the timetable in the case. Now, the yeah. NIO was asked for a statement and it said timetabling of inquests in Northern Ireland is a matter for coroners, yeah. Yeah. but given we have a coroner criticising the police for delaying tactics, that doesn't make any sense, does well, it? You, you'll forgive me if I don't get into the weeds of a particular of a, of a particular case that's before the courts at the moment. That wouldn't be appropriate for a minister. But, that, but that's uh, the point. It's a uh, good example of what the difficulties might be down the line. Well, it, it's, it's not unknown for there to be lengthy delays in coronial inquests where there's a lot of national security sensitive information or sensitive information uh, that needs to be uh, uh, examined by the, uh, by the police or by the armed forces um, before anything is actually handed over. Uh, one of the benefits of the new system is actually... Yeah, but, we, but, we, but the we, point we, is that we, the, NIO we said, this. the NIO said it's up to coroners to set the timetable for inquests. In this case, the coroner cannot act in line with the timetable that he wants to set. As I say, the, these, these sorts of delays are not unknown uh, in coronial inquests, which is why, one of the reasons why Sir Declan Morgan, when he was Lord Chief Justice, uh, a number of years ago set out to reform the system to try and speed things up. Yeah. And Sean Brown was murdered in 1997. I, I, I understand. I understand. 26 yeah, years ago. I understand. And I understand you know, many people have waited a long time uh, for these inquests to, uh, to start, to be granted, to get off the ground, uh, and, 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 and so on. Uh, which is one of the reasons why, under our proposals, we want to try and get more answers, more information to people in a more timely manner than has been possible through the coronial inquest system. Okay. It's interesting to hear you talking about your expectation that there will be embarrassments to the British state to come. I mean, on on what scale would you expect those I can't embarrassments possi to I be? can't possibly answer that. Um, my own view is that uh, during the course of Operation Banner, uh, over 250,000, 300,000 people served, the vast majority in the police and the armed forces, the vast majority you know, did an extremely professional, honourable uh, and courageous job. And I'm on record many times as saying that without their service and sacrifice, there would have been no priest process. So we owe them an enormous gra gra uh, debt That's of honour. That's a separate issue, isn't uh, it? However, um, uh, there will, of course, course, you know, during that 30-year period, uh, be examples of where people, you know, didn't live up to the highest standards. And, of course, you know, I, I fully expect this process will identify uh, some uh, cases where that, where that happened. OK, so Bloody Sunday was an embarrassment, uh, Bally Murphy was an embarrassment, and there will be more to come. Uh, it, it would be almost inconceivable that when you've got 300,000 people you know, plus who served, that there aren't some examples. But overall, my contention has always been that the record of the British state, of the RUC, the armed forces in Northern Ireland was an honourable one. The Dublin government, Lord Cain, has made it very clear your proposals are seriously flawed in its view. The tonish to Micheál Martin's on the record stating his view that this bill will undermine reconciliation in Northern Ireland, not assist it. And the Irish government wants the bill to be paused for further consultation. Why aren't you taking that view seriously? Well, we continue to, to talk to the Irish government about these matters, and you'll be aware that the British-Irish Intergovernmental uh, Conference is meeting in London next week. So we can I had meetings with Department of Foreign Affairs um, uh, a couple of weeks ago to discuss, to discuss some of these issues. Um, I think, um, yeah, I would echo uh, what uh, Sir Declan said earlier uh, in the week in an interview, which is you know, to encourage Dublin to work with the new, uh, with the new body and, and alongside it and to cooperate. As I say, the, the, the overarching objective of the body is to um, get more information to more people in a more timely manner. And I think, you know, just taking a step back, Mark, you know, I've been very clear that... Um, uh, I was, uh, when I introduced this in the House of Lords last year, that yeah, I understand and completely appreciate that this legislation is very challenging uh, and difficult for many people. It's difficult for me. I, I, was, yeah, I said in the chamber, I find it challenging, uh, not least yeah, because of my own personal circumstances. I worked alongside the lady in Gao, 
uh, uh, when I was a, a young researcher in politics. Um, and, you know, three weeks or so before he was blown up by the Provisional IRA, you know, I was having lunch with him in the House of Commons. So, as I said in the chamber, you know, I'm not immune to the feelings of those who've lost friends and loved ones uh, to, to violence, to terrorism. Um, and that's when I made the pledge that I wanted to try and uh, Im improve the bill. Um, but what we, um, you know, what, we, what we have to do is step back and make a realistic assessment. You know, 25 years after the agreement, 29 years after the ceasefires, over half a century since the troubles began, what we can realistically de deliver for people in circumstances where the prospects of prosecutions is going to be vanishingly rare. Yeah, but here is the point, the final point on this issue. If the Dublin government, the US government, all of the local political parties here in Northern Ireland, the opposition parties at Westminster, multiple human rights organisations and victims groups think your bill is a bad idea, who precisely, apart from the government, thinks it's a good idea? Well, as I say, we you know, we have a responsibility to make a realistic assessment of what we can deliver but, for but victims. Who agrees that this is the way victims. forward? Well, who I, well, supports well, your well, proposed well, legislation? Well, 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 without naming names, I have met people who support the uh, who support the legislation. Uh, I've also well, had, you, well I, I, veterans I, I, groups I, I, seem to support it, but I, I, apart from well, veterans I've, groups, I've also, I've, who else I've, thinks I've, it's a good idea? I've also well, it's interesting. Um, you talk to people, um, and they 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 agree with the. Um, quite often with the overarching uh, aim, which is information recovery um, uh, as, as a model. Most people, when you talk to them, accept that prosecutions are going to be, you know, if, if at all, very limited. I think the, the, the contentious, uh, most contentious element of the bill is, of course, the conditional immunity scheme. Yeah. Um, and that's, that, that's really where the opposition But do you not think you from. need to be able to do better as the NAO minister responsible for pushing this through than to say, I have met people who support the proposed legislation? Well, I, I, I mean, when you compare that to the list of organisations and individuals I have quoted who are opposed to it, yes. you should be able to as I, as I said, do better as than I, that. As I said earlier, um, finding uh, 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 any kind of consensus around legacy has eluded success. Well, there is consensus that this is not good legislation. Um, I, I would urge people to, um, I, on this, it's a new approach, the proof of the pudding, uh, etc., will be in eating. I would, and, and of course, you know, in Declan Morgan, we've appointed a, a commissioner, designate at the moment, but you know, ready to take up powers once this bill gets royal assent, you know, who I think will ensure, it will, will gain the trust of families uh, and, and, and victims and survivors and will ensure a seamless transition between the existing processes and the new ones okay. to deliver better outcomes for victims and survivors. I appreciate that in many areas this bill requires some difficult moral and political judgments, but I think overall we have to be realistic. The NIO Minister, Lord Kane. One of the bill's staunchest critics is the crossbench peer, Baroness O'Lone. What does she now make of it? It's still not fit for purpose. The government have tabled nearly 40 pages of amendments, but they're all tweaks at the edge of a situation in which people are being deprived of basic rights to full investigation, proper investigation, to inquests, to civil actions, and with this awful... Um, spectre of immunity running right through it. Do you see any substantive way in which the proposed bill has been improved by Lord Kane's amendments? No, it's been made worse because when we first got the bill, it said that um, any any legacy interview inquest which was uh, underway would continue. But now it says that if it's not at final determination stage on the 1st of May 2024, it's finished. Now, if you, you, I heard you mention to Lord Kane the Brown family. Now, I know, because I've been in contact with him, that Sean Brown's family have endured 40 days of hearings already on that inquest, and they still haven't got the documents that the MOD and the PSNI are supposed to be providing to them. In the course of that, they'll have run out costs. There'll be a lot of legal costs attaching to this kind of thing for all the families involved in inquests, all the families who've started civil actions, which may not finish by 2024 and they'll lose that money unless the government produced something. So what, this, what we have now is actually worse than what we started with. And yet the NAO's line is that the coroners set the timetables. What do you make of that? The coroners set the timetables, but those for whom they set the timetables rarely observe them. You get repeated reappearances in the coronial court where the family are asking for the information to be provided and the police and the MOD are saying they don't have the resources to deal with the information to allow them to provide it. 
So the bill says that um, people can, uh, that the commissioner can reasonably ask for information. But the question of what is reasonable, there's no, no determination, nothing in the bill about... So that would have to be argued That in would the have process. to be argued. When I was police ombudsman, I simply had a power to request information. So the ICRIR will not even have the powers which I had as police ombudsman, yet it's supposed to be doing a much more extensive job. Yeah, your default position seems to be that the authorities would not necessarily wish to provide the information in all circumstances. That's based on your experience as police ombudsman, is it? It's based on my experience as police ombudsman, on my experience of seven years dealing with the Metropolitan Police in the Daniel Morgan case, and on my experience of now seven years working with the Canova investigation into Steak Knife and the Glenarm Gang. Sir Declan Morgan, though, is someone who has pushed hard for inquests when he was Lord Chief Justice. And there are people who would say that while this system may not be perfect, may be far from perfect, there is a man there who's going to be in the driving seat for this commission and there will be others around him who want to get to the truth and should be given the benefit of the doubt. Can you see the merit in that argument? I, I don't have any doubt about Sir Declan Morgan. I mean, I, I absolutely respect him. He's Although you have judge. said you don't think he should have taken on this role in this designate capacity. I've said, I've said that I think the legislation is such that I am surprised that he took it on because the legislation, to my mind, is not compliant with the uh, requirements of the Human Rights Act and because it still won't be. Because, for example, supposing we take some sensitive intelligence, Mark, and supposing the Commission gets some of that sensitive intelligence and suppose they want to use it in a report like an inquest report, OK? Not a report to the DPP or anything like that, an inquest report. They have to go to the Secretary of State. Every time they want to use any intelligence information, they have to ask permission from the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State has 60 days on each request to use that information and can turn around and say no and doesn't even always have to explain it. My experience tells me that there are those who will have information which they will be prepared to give and there are those who will not disclose the information which they have for multiple reasons. Um, can I just push you further on whether or not you think this process is going to be Article 2 compliant, human rights compliant? Sir Declan Morgan said everything that the Commission does, it seems to me, has to be compliant with the European Convention on Human Rights and has to respect the rights and obligations that are contained within the 1998 agreement. So it'll be for the Commission to devise mechanisms to ensure that an Article 2 compliant approach can be taken in relation to any inquests that come our way. Do, do you have confidence that that can be delivered? Because he says he's determined to make that happen. Yes, and I respect his determination, but I say again, he doesn't even have a right to require information from these people. He doesn't even have that. In the original bill, as drafted, he had the powers to use, uh, to seek communications data and things like that under the Regula Regulation Investigatory Powers Act. They've removed that. They say it's not necessary. But I do know that in recent investigations and legacy investigations in Northern Ireland, Precisely those powers have been used. So he hasn't got the full range of powers, although his staff will have the powers and privileges of a constable, he still hasn't got the huge, the whole range of powers. Um, the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, is on the record saying a Labour government led by him would repeal this legislation. Do yes. you believe that could happen? That would be a significant priority for a new Labour government? Well, if they want to repeal the legislation, I think they should, in the House of Lords, in the coming weeks, they should act to take out of the legislation those parts of the legislation which aren't acceptable to the people of Northern Ireland. Do you get any sense that that's what's going to happen? I think we'll have to wait for next week. But Lord Kane is fairly confident that this is going to get through. The government have a majority, uh, but they don't have a majority in the Lords. I think the bill will get through in some form because we can't stop it in its entirety. I hope there will be further changes to it before it gets through. So if it does find its way onto the statute books and if in 12 months or 18 months' time Keir Starmer finds himself the occupant of number 10, do you think the clock can be turned back? I don't think there'll be any appetite for it then. This will be a problem that is, for the eyes of the United Populations of Great Britain, solved. They don't need to go back there. So, so you think that Keir Starmer would, at that point, be going back on his word, would he? I don't know, but I can't see it being a major priority in a government which is facing inflation, recession, all sorts of problems in its uh, 
major infrastructure and services, I can't see it being a priority. And of course, at that point, presumably, the Commission would be active and serious amounts of money potentially would have been spent. And I think it will take them a year, really, to get up and going, because if you look at it, none of the normal rules and procedures that apply to the kind of work I was doing and the kind of work the PS and I do as investigation, none of them apply, apart from basic um, powers and privileges of constable. Everything has to be written, mostly by the Secretary of State. And the Secretary of State has enormous power in this process. Baroness O'Lone talking to me earlier. In a moment,